Welcome to part three of this video about big business and big institutions. Um, so we indicated a little bit the problems and how they arise. Uh, but I want to focus a little bit more on the solution in uh, this final part. And if we look, for instance, at the uh, post-World War I era, uh, people were appalled at how the First World War could have happened. Everybody was, nobody wanted it to happen, but they were powerless to stop it. The system of conventions and promises had a will of its own, and there was not really a single person who could be indicated as, you are the cause of the war, or you are the evil one, as we would have liked. And um, the American president, Woodrow Wilson, also recognized that um, basically the system was getting out of control. It was in a way leading a life of its own, dragging people or transforming people. And um, he started a very nice initiative, the League of Nations. And how he did this is, I think, a great example. So he took world leaders who are usually identified with their role as king or president or minister or ambassador and he just grabbed them all, took them out for a ride and dumped them in a forest. And in that forest, people stop being presidents or kings or ministers. They start being people again. They start relating with each other again as person to person, rather as institution to institution. But in a way, he tried to bring back the humanity and he trusted that if the persons would interact with each other as humans again, then the goodwill which is within these people would triumph and would create new harmony, uh, new brotherhood between all nations. Unfortunately, the institution he started also fell prey to the same uh, Arimanic impulses and beca became the United Nations, which is again a rather bureaucratic institution which is mired in yeah, faceless bureaucrats and uh, yeah, powerless systems of control. It becomes too arimanic. But he had a very good idea. Unfortunately it was not maintained because the desire for control, the desire for um, stability is very great in our egos. But we have to learn that we can't always follow our egos, even in earthly matters. Sometimes it is necessary to listen to our spirits. <clears throat> and uh, this process of returning their humanity to people is very important. Because if we see what happens to people after they've been exposed to it, it seems to have a very lasting effect. So a person can be like join a union, to work for the betterment of his fellow people, for his fellow workers, and then move into politics, and then becomes twisted by that process, and ends up not, when leaving politics, not going back to the union, but starting to work for banks and insurance companies and mega companies, because they've become used to working with power, used to applying their influence, and they become politicized, they become wielders of power rather than going back to the ideals or the humanity they possessed before. And it is very similar to actually any addiction process. It doesn't matter whether a person is addicted to alcohol or heroin or sex or power, um, because it gives a thrill, it gives a kick, and people long for it and they identify more with the moment when they have this kick, when they have this power, when they have this buzz, then at the dull, with the dull periods in between. And so it is also for politicians. Once they've tasted power, they want to taste it again, they want to have it again. And in the same way as, like the same dosage doesn't continue to give the same thrill, people who smell power, they want to get more and more and more of their drug. And just like with any drug, the first thing they have to do is to realize that it is wrong, that it is an addiction, that they're no longer in control of themselves. And this is where it becomes a lot more difficult with politics and money and big business, 
compared to the drugs which we consider evil and um, yeah inappropriate. So if a person is a drunk, he in a way is uh, told by many people, this is not good, this is a bad thing, you're a drunk, you're ruining your life, stop it. But if a person is addicted to power, to money, to greed, then most people say like, wow, he or she is so successful, so wonderful, I want to be like him or like her. And they get reinforced in their behavior. So we have to, in a way, stop idealizing these addicts, power addicts. And we have to help them to realize that they're, in a way, sick, they've become afflicted, they've become twisted. But also they should be aware that there is a cure, that their egos can grow less strong, their spirits can go stronger, and they can develop higher tastes. But yeah, they need a lot of support in getting out of this pattern. And one of the things which is really uh, problematic also is the amount of pressure and uh, time pressure people are in in modern society. And that, now I'm not talking about just the politicians or people in power. But our spirit wants to grow, wants to learn. And to do that it has to have the opportunity, the energy and the time to really absorb what we have experienced and transform itself, to transform its personality. And if we're all the time running and struggling to keep up, to make enough money, to pay the bills, to get our work done, uh, and we are burdened by responsibility so that even in our so-called time off, where we still have to run and think and plan and worry, um, our spirit doesn't really have a chance to take control of our lives. Um, it has to find an opening so it can enter into our lives. And for this it is very important, of course, to have periods of prayer or uh, meditation or just relaxation so we can find ourselves again. Uh, but also, in a way, the uh, complexity of, of our lives and the world, uh, of our, uh, how we lead our lives and how our economical system works is in a way counterproductive for the spiritual growth, which is actually the purpose of life on this planet. Life exists. So spirits can come here and transform themselves. But if the spirits can come here but they can't work on themselves, they can only serve other powers, the powers of society, of family, of duty, of nations, of the economy, then they're no longer here yeah, to grow and to work on themselves. But this becomes a prison camp. And our planet becomes just yeah, a, a forced labor camp where people have to, are forced to work just to maintain their existence. And there have been many of such periods in the past. And uh, there it was very clear because the slave masters were external to us. So you had this um, uh, lord who owned the land and the people who lived on the land. Or you had this plantation owner who owned the people who were working on the plantation. And now we have this illusion that we are not owned that we are free. But if you look at the period in the American history when they abolished uh, the slavery, and you see that actually the conditions for the people working on the plantations were worse than during the period of slavery. And um, in a way a slave is a possession and people tend to in a way see slaves as an investment, something to be taken care of. You don't want them to get sick, you don't want them to um, rebel against you. Uh, you want them to be good and strong workers. And you, there's a feeling of responsibility towards them. If you look at modern managers, especially in the American way of management, they see people as expendable. Something you use up and then you throw it away and then you get a new one. So it's very much a consumption society, a consumption economy we're in. So managers are in a way taught like, okay, if I get a new employee, how to squeeze them dry for a period of four years, and then when they're just about to have a heart attack or a burnout, you dump them again. Preferably just before. And um, this way of thinking, this way of working, this way of uh, uh, economical system is being exported into 
Europe, into Asia. Um, and ultimately this is a very detrimental system to human development because the people are in a way uh, so stressed and eventually when they do break down then they can work on themselves, they can realize themselves and try to catch up for all the time they've had to ignore their spirit, ignore their calling. Um, but I don't think the system of, in a way, um, yeah, being overburdened and then needing to compensate is necessarily the best or the most harmonious system. I would prefer for a more uh, stable system in which people can balance their human needs with the needs of society, with the needs of uh, the world. Because if we look at it, it is not so much that um, a lot of work is actually um, very necessary. It is made necessary. It is made complex. Um, because we, compared to previous generations, we now have a lot of machines, we have computers, we have robots. So from one hour of human work, the productivity is much higher. It keeps on rising every year. Um, but somehow, we still have to work longer hours or more hours, rather than only working one or two hours a day and yeah, have produced as much as yeah, uh, an ordinary person would have produced in a whole day a couple of hundred years ago. So we have to learn to pace ourselves and in a way to control our greed, to control the mechanism which forces us to buy something new, to get something new all the time and um, to choose in a way to stabilize ourselves and this may seem in a way boring like gosh you're just sitting there what are you doing <laughs> and um, in a way it is boring because our minds are always hungry they always want to have a new stimulus a new thing to inspire us to engage us because if we don't have that, we actually have to feel, we have to go down to our hearts. And if yeah, our feelings are not driving us, then we have to go down to our bellies to feel what is really my desire, what is really my need, instead of being busy with the mind all the time. And the shift towards the mind is also very unhealthy for the body and the psychological health as well. Because thinking is basically a survival mechanism. Animals tend not to think unless there's really a very big problem. And our body reacts to thinking a lot and to a lot of stimuli with stress hormones. It's like, oh my God, what is wrong? I'm being threatened. Things are changing all the time. And it is not our evolutionary pattern that things change all the time. And we're harming ourselves by creating a society in which things have to change all the time in which things are unstable. So a lot of the mental health problems, which as you may know, occur mainly in modern Western world and are not as frequent nor as severe in so-called developing countries. Um, so in a way our modern society is making us at least psychologically ill and also physically ill. So what are we sacrificing our health for? What are we sacrificing our spiritual goals for and yeah ultimately the system has taken over and we're no longer in control and also the powers which we would want to be in control the light cosmos is also no longer in control it is no longer the major power inspiring us because of these low vibrations which we become attuned to because of the weakness of our spirit which becomes overcome by our ego and it's an uphill struggle. It's like a guerrilla war to try to maintain your own spiritual growth. But only by doing this and by, in a way, helping other people to do this, we can have a revolution. We can create a change in a peaceful way, in an individual way, where by choosing to live differently, we, in a way, start attracting forces which help us to live differently. But it does need a critical mass. If I'm doing this all by myself, it's not going to go anywhere. I'm not going to change the world by myself. But if there are millions of people who choose to live in this way, then we start attracting um, these light egregores, these light impulses which inspire us, which guide us, 
and which help us to transform the world by showing us what we can do by guiding us so that our actions become the most effective and the most useful possible and still it's a struggle because not everybody will agree with us not everybody will want the same thing but if we can stop at least from being misled so that people can do what they want to do instead of getting trapped in systems and trapped in energy flows which they don't want to be trapped in that's already a major victory people can become aware of who am I? Where do I want to go? Where am I going? And how to try to navigate, how to get closer to my spiritual goals. Okay, I hope this has been inspiring to you. Thank you for listening.